Good morning, everybody. This is Lisa Timmerman, the Executive Director of Historic Dumfries, Virginia, and the Weems Potts Museum. I thought it might be fun to virtually invite you into our annex this morning so that you can take a peek into a comic book called The Man Who Planted the Cherry Tree by Leland Smith. In 1800, the parson never suspects. In 1800, the year following George Washington's death, Mason Locke Weems, the parson, was a happy, successful man. In an average year, he would sell 3,000 Bibles and a great many more religious works, histories, pamphlets, Pilgrim's Progress, children's books. In hundreds of homes up and down the new states of the eastern seaboard, the parson was always welcome. Many a rosy-cheeked frontier girl was married by minister book salesman Weems. After the wedding, the young couple was always more than willing to buy Bibles with which to record the birthdays of their new children, as well as farm and cookbooks with which to stock their new homes. Housewarmings, log rollings, and other merry gatherings all dipped in curseeds to his lively fiddle bow, his stories, his news from other settlements. All left such meetings with smiles on their faces and books they had just bought from the parson under their arms. And who was more needed than an Edinburgh University trained doctor? The first rays of many a morning sun must have light lit many backwoods clearings to see the doctor book salesman just ending an all night vigil at the bedside of an expiring grandparent, a farmer trampled by cow or horse, or a mother giving birth to her first child. On Sundays, the parson book salesman generally found an empty pulpit or a leaderless flock. If no churches were available, he held services under a shady tree. His sermons were powerful, his words those of the frontier. When death came, who could conduct services with which understanding of the grief of those who sorrow? And what could have been more consoling to the bereaved than one of Parsons' many religious tracts? Weems was known to have suddenly risen from the throng even before August state legislatures, and by first giving an invocation, then following with a compelling oration, spoken before legislators. He is said to have pretended to be falling down drunk, then when a crowd had gathered, magically sober up and delivered temperance lectures. At the end of these performances, people bought books. By 1800, not only was Weems the colonist's greatest book salesman, his own Life of Washington came out that year. From the first, there were many reprintings. By the fifth edition, the book included The Cherry Tree and other of his famous tales. It was for this reason that a Philadelphia publisher, Caleb Wayne, went looking for Weems. Wayne had agreed to publish, and John Marshall, even then a Supreme Court justice, had agreed to author their own many-volumed Life of Washington. The Supreme Court justice was hoping profits from the book would get him out of his many debts. Flip the page here. Everybody, it seemed to Weems, wanted to use the dead Washington only to help himself. Chief Justice of the United States and his publisher, Caleb Wayne, other publishers later on, had believed they could make 150,000 profit from Marshall by selling 30,000 sets of four or five sets of books about Washington. But the parson owned books were already selling. Thomas Jefferson, leader of the Democrat Republicans, had opposite views from Washington's. So he had induced Joel Bar Barlow to also write a book about Washington, but from Jefferson's point of view. Marshall was the leader of the Federalist Party. His books would defend Washington's actions. This was all part of the bitterness of the elections in 1800, 1804, and 1808. In fact, Jefferson had won in 1800 only after a tie vote was decided by the U.S. House of Representatives. Most books at that time were sold by our local postmasters. Since the president appointed the postmaster generals and they appointed the postmasters, independent book salesmen were very important to shaping the minds of the nation. This meant the parson was caught between many fires. He could not turn down a publisher because publishers sold all kinds of books. Some sold easily, some not at all. But publishers manufactured the product that he sold, the source of his income. So he had to please both political parties and also several publishers. 
but it can be said that of Washington books that the Parsons sold, he must have realized only his was trying to paint an unbiased picture of the man who was George Washington. Poor Parson Weems. Just because the man mentioned Washington, everybody turned against him. The young men and women he had married and sold books to drove him out of their homes. People he had set up with night after night curing them when they were near death wouldn't speak to him. It seemed to the Parson that he didn't have a friend left in the world. The two years that followed, 1801 and 1802, were the most disappointing years of his life. He thought that something might be wrong with him because, all of a sudden, master salesman that he was, he couldn't sell any books. President Thomas Jefferson sent men to heckle the parson whenever he appeared. They led mobs to break up his meetings. People even began to throw stones. One time in South Carolina, the Jefferson bullies unhitched his horse, then turned his buggy over in the mud. Then they made him take out his fiddle and play for them. Weems tried every sales trick he knew. He tried to interest the people in maps of battles of the revolution that they knew about, but no one would listen. By the end of two years, the parson had sold only $4,000 worth of books instead of the $150,000 he wanted to sell. Weems began to worry about what would happen to this new nation if the people continued to hate Washington. Finally, in Pennsylvania, one cold night, after he had just barely talked himself out of being tarred and feathered by the people of the town, he sat in his great coat in his cold room. He kept seeing the faces of the many angry people who hated Washington. He debated with himself almost many hours that night. He almost decided to give up, but he had preached at Washington's church and knew that Washington was a great man. And even though the people didn't understand, Weems knew that Washington had done a magnificent job as the nation's first president. So that's just a little taste of this interesting comic book. Uh, I was reading from a little bit of a later version. You were looking at one of the early versions. And this is one that I was reading from. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, and I hope this gave you some variety to your day. Bye.